Chapter six, a new nation. By the 1780s, Americans had grown dissatisfied with their loose confederation of colonies. A decade earlier, Americans facing tyranny from abroad had purposefully avoided creating a strong national government of their own. But now they began to rethink that decision. The biggest advocates for a stronger national government were James Madison of Virginia, James Madison, and Alexander, uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, the son of a Scottish merchant from the West Indies and a New York lawyer. Um, after news of Shays' Rebellion had spread across the country uh, under the Articles of Confederation, previously content national leaders, including General George Washington, agreed to meet at a new constitutional convention in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. 1787, just a few years into the experiment. These founding fathers, as they're often called, or founders, if you prefer that, uh, were relatively young, well-educated, and wealthy, and had good reason to fear the turbulence and follies of democracy. Their specific charge to, was to rework the existing Articles of Confederation, but once in session, they began to rethink the structure of the American government entirely. At that closed-door Philadelphia convention, larger states had to contend with concerns from smaller states, uh, who feared they would be ceding their autonomy to the more populous states in any new arrangement. James Madison's Virginia plan, his Virginia plan, proved to be the winning framework, a bicameral Congress with a House and a Senate divided between a weighted House based on uh, population and an equal Senate, uh, and it provided a path forward. Though no serious discussion of abolishing slavery occurred at the convention, uh, the topic of their representation of slaves and status threatened to derail the, uh, the convention. Were slaves persons or taxable property? Such a simple question threatened the entire proceedings. As summer wore on and as temperatures flared, a great compromise took shape, the great compromise. A two house legislature with slaves counting for three fifths of a person in the lower house of representatives. So they would be counted, but not entirely. This appeased slave states who said they should be counted, right? They wanted their slaves to be counted as people for the purpose of political representation. Northern states argued against it, wanted them as property. The convention also agreed to bar the new government from stopping the slave trade for 20 years in order to keep the smaller slave states at the table. The United States Constitution, our founding fathers uh, drafted, failed to fully address citizenship, the status of Indians, the status of Indian lands and treaties, and it did not specify a list of individual rights reserved to the people. It did, however, answer the question of where sovereignty lay. Power flowed from the people directly through their efforts at self-determination and through their free elections. Federalism divides power between the states and the federal government and left the people responsible for keeping both in check. Uh, the theory of the separation of power, sometimes called you know, checks and balances, um, between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches of the federal government worked to keep those in power honest. This federal structure was designed to protect the nation from another kind of despotism that threatened during Shays' Rebellion. The tyranny of the people was something that many of the founders feared. The unchecked exercise of the popular will represented its own challenges and thus only the House would be elected directly by the people under this government. The Senate would be chosen indirectly by the state legislatures and the nation's president by an electoral college of political elites from among the states. When they finally emerged from their secretive toiling, it became clear that the delegates at the Philadelphia Convention had greatly exceeded their instructions from Congress and the states. They had produced a new plan for a totally different form of government. And so the delegates asked special state conventions, not the state legislatures, to ratify this document that they had created. The new constitution sparked a national debate in American politics. Supporters of the new constitution called themselves very wisely federalists, emphasizing the layers of government, a sort of misnomer designed to reduce fears over their vision for a highly nationalized new form of American government. The Federalists called their critics, those opposed to the new constitution, anti-federalists, suggesting that these advocates for less powerful central government offered nothing but opposition to the new plan. What they really wanted was just the, the old Articles of Confederation. They liked things the way they were. The anti-federalists worried that the new constitution as written threatened increased taxes, weakened states, and minimized uh, individual liberty. Special state conventions moved quickly to ratify the new document, with the framers making their case in newspaper editorials published throughout the states. Every state but Rhode Island ratified this constitution, many on the promise that a bill of individual rights long sought by the anti-federalists would quickly be added 
uh, as individual amendments to this constitution, what will become known as the Bill of Rights and all of those newspaper writings are collectively known as the Federalist Papers today. Elections under the new constitution began in 1789 and General George Washington, the hero of the Revolutionary War, was unanimously endorsed as the first president by the Electoral College from among the states. The first Congress proposed 12 amendments to the constitution to satisfy those anti-federalists, 10 of which were ratified by the states into the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Congress also incorporated national judiciary system organized underneath the Supreme Court and created the executive departments of state, treasury, and war underneath the executive office of the president. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and the Federalists got the first crack at governing this new country, controlling the federal government for the first 12 years under the United States Constitution. Hamilton wanted to create a permanent national bank and a permanent national debt to ensure that the wealthy and the powerful would always have a stake in the American experiment. He proposed taxes on alcohol and imports uh, in order to foster a healthy ruling class, a commercial economy, and a thriving manufacturing industry. Much of Hamilton's plan was ratified by Congress, including the National Bank, which Congress didn't explicitly have the authority to create under the Constitution. Under the Federalists, a compromise was reached on the location of a southern national capital in the swamps between Maryland and Virginia, the District of Columbia, what we sometimes call Washington, D.C. Federalist government also successfully halted the Whiskey Rebellion in Pennsylvania, the Whiskey Rebellion, and this is the first test of this new government in Pennsylvania through intimidation and accepted the bids of Westerners for statehood in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. The country will grow. The ability of the Supreme Court under the Constitution to nullify acts by Congress remained in question through this era, the Federalist era, but the Supreme Court's Marbury versus Madison decision made the judiciary a co-equal branch of this new government with Chief Justice John Marshall cementing this balance under the Constitution. We will have a sort of a co-equal branches under the judiciary, the legislative branch, the Congress, and the executive branch after Marbury versus Madison. The framers of the Constitution had largely handled their controversies by papering over them with compromises. Their disagreements survived the Revolutionary Era, and the era of compromise had largely ended by 1790, when the Anti-Federalists unified under a so-called Republican vision, and it began to organize a political resistance to this Federalist regime. Most of the framers of the Constitution believed that political parties should be avoided in this country. Anti-Federalist Republicans had begun to believe that Hamilton and his, uh, his Federalist compadres had become a sort of dangerous faction that must be quashed or America risked becoming as corrupt as Great Britain. Republicans began to organize a vigorous political opposition. They banded together to influence state and local elections, they formed committees and societies, and they joined causes. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were the most prominent spokesmen for the cause of an agrarian republic in the United States a republic wary of tyrannical nationalism and emboldened in part by the violent democratic French revolution taking place half a world away. Thomas Jefferson would have accepted anarchy over the despotism akin, uh, to King George III. And he famously argued that the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. The election of 1796 signaled the end of Washington's tenure as national leader and he refused to run very famously for a third term. And he articulated his rationale uh, within his 1796 farewell address to the American people. In addition, the Federals had to deal internationally with a revolutionary French government that had gone to war with Great Britain. America soon found itself in an unauthorized war with France called the Quasi War after the XYZ affair, while trying to maintain economic ties with both the French and the British. The Federalists under John Adams, who would succeed Washington, used their international wartime victories to push their, uh, for controversial legislation designed to put an end to their Republican opposition. The explicitly Federalist Alien and Sedition Acts placed new obstacles in the way of foreigners who wished to become American citizens and gave the government power to prosecute acts that could be interpreted as libelous or treasonous or more often simply anti-Federalist the Republicans who were targeted by this legislation in response argued that states could nullify laws that exceeded constitutional authority, laws like the Alien and Sedition Acts. States could undo acts uh, by the United States federal government. And literal fist fights soon broke out in state houses and in the U.S. Congress as a result. 
The bitter political controversies of the 1790s had led to the so-called Revolution of 1800. There it is, the Revolution of 1800. The election of 1800 pitted President John Adams, the Federalist heir to the Washington legacy, versus Thomas Jefferson, a Republican, the heir to the anti-Federalist legacy. This is the second time they met. Opponents accused Jefferson of representing the wild anarchy of the French Revolution in 1800, and Republicans, or anti-Federalists, accused President Adams of aspiring to become king and to enslave the people. The vote came down to New York, where an unexpected electoral tie between Jefferson and vice presidential candidate Aaron Burr threw the unprecedented election into the hands of the House of Representatives, who endorsed the presidential candidate Thomas Jefferson, despite desperate work of Tammany Hall, political machine. I mentioned Aaron Burr, he'll come up again down the road. Only the judiciary was left in the hands of the Federalists after the 1800 election. This is why we're calling it the Revolution of 1800. Uh, big changes are afoot here. The outgoing Adams administration stayed up late into the night before inauguration of Thomas Jefferson, appointing federal justices and judges, the so-called midnight appointments under Adams, in order to attempt to neuter the incoming Republican revolution in government. Despite this controversial move, Adams and Jefferson transferred power peacefully, and the bitter political conflicts of the Federalist era were now over. I'm recording this approximately 35 days before the 2020 presidential election, and this is probably a good reminder uh, to bring up or invoke the uh, 1776 uh, farewell of Washington, President Washington. There's an opinion Washington wrote, that parties in free countries are useful checks against the administration of the government and serve to keep alive the spirit of liberty. This he conceded was probably true, but in a republic like ours, he said the danger was not in too little partisanship, but too much. A fire not to be quenched, Washington warned. It demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into a flame, lest instead of warming, it should consume. For every parade, Thanksgiving proclamation, or grand procession honoring the unity of the nation, there was also some political controversy reminding American citizens of how fragile their new union was. And as party differences and regional quarrels tested the federal government, the new nation increasingly explored the limits of its democracy.